All right. Uh, so yeah, we're talking about um, resolving conflicts in the church. Um, but here's a question in the chat from Christopher um, regarding communion. Okay, let's uh, answer it. In some denominations, there is an expectation that repentance, confession needs to be done before taking Holy Communion. Uh, so this is in line with what Paul says, uh, Christopher, that one must examine you know, their heart uh, and take communion in a worthy manner. So self-examination is a good thing, uh, but there is no biblical basis uh, to make someone confess their sins, uh, confession, if we confess it to God, you know, that should be sufficient. But then there are certain other uh, sins where it is important for us to confess to people, but not every sin needs to be confessed to a particular person. So uh, there, there is to mandate this before communion would be unnecessary because we don't see that in scripture. And I hope that answers your question, Christopher. Yeah, okay, right, thank you. So uh, I think that is also clear. I was saying that the simple and the common way of resolving conflicts is to um, you know, first deal with, uh, let two people who have the issue talk to each other. Uh, if that doesn't help, then have a third person step in and resolve the matter. If that doesn't help, then the leaders or the pastors can step in and try to resolve the matter. Uh, and then I was saying that not every issue is as simple as that. You know, sometimes there can be a matter where you know there's been um, a financial uh, um, what can you say? You know, someone has cheated another person for a large sum of money. Okay, uh, and uh, it is a big deal, whatever has taken place between two believers. Or oh, what about, you know, something to do with the real estate? Everything was going well, believers were, were dealing uh, uh, well with things, they were interacting well, they were trying to help each other, and then suddenly you, you hear this news about one brother uh, trying to cheat another brother uh, with regard to a, uh, uh, you know, land matter. So it may not even be like someone has tried to cheat another person. It could be a, like a subtle misunderstanding leading into, you know, uh, other things, and then before you know it, the, the matter is quite big and uh, the, the pastor comes to know about it and then we have to deal with it because you know otherwise what will happen it will affect the rest of the the community and it will affect the local church so there can be issues like this what about uh, you know divorce what uh, divorce, family matters family issues uh, that can happen um, among people business Maybe two believers in, a, in the church, they're doing well in their business and they partner for some reason and, you know, an issue arises. So how, what do we do in such situations? What does uh, scripture has to say? Uh, in fact, uh, Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 1 through 8, it is there in our notes, page 127. Uh, he says that, you know, uh, believers can judge. Believers are capable of judging issues. And he sort of uh, rebukes the Corinthian church uh, and he tells the church not even to go to uh, an external, you know, uh, a judge or a uh, anything, a court. So he says, we are going to judge the, the world uh, as believers. Then why can't we judge these matters? So he's encouraging the believers to uh, judge, you know, within the community. Now, by taking this instruction, even when there are complicated issues, you know, it is possible for uh, us as leaders to, to help resolve the matter within the church. Okay, that would be ideal. If we can resolve it within the church, that would be the best thing to do. In fact, uh, scripture here in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 5, you know, he says, uh, 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 it is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren. So it is going to need somebody with wisdom to speak into that situation and bring uh, peace. So we can try to judge that matter. Now, how can this be done? Okay, an issue arises. It would be good if we have uh, some elders of the church okay, or, or people who 
have had experience over the years to step in and you know speak the wisdom of god in that particular issue let me i'm just giving one example let's take a, 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 a like a huge marriage uh, conflict okay that's going on between the husband and the wife so how to resolve it so if there are elders of the church it will be good if they can speak and they can you know try to um, bring resolution but it is also advisable uh, to have a set of people who are experienced in that area so you know what if there is a qualified uh, christian uh, a believer who attends church but they are qualified uh, in marriage counseling they they uh, have one they have a background in uh, psychology and counseling and things like that so it will be really good if we have people who are experienced in that particular area in business now an elder of the church may not have the expertise to comment on certain things so spiritually yes uh, we can take scripture we can you know speak the truth of god's word to people and try to bring some uh, resolution but if there is someone who is experienced in the area of business a christian person uh, and they can they can uh, bring wisdom into that situation it will be even better so the point is it's good to have the pastor can know um, elders who can help in so he has these people these are the people uh, you know who can step in at a time like this they may be from the church or they may not be uh, from this particular church but maybe they are from another church a counselor but the pastor should know where to send the uh, church folks so that's the whole thing so then they can provide you know their expert advice to resolve the problem and uh, so that is a practical thing to do okay uh, and one more thing you know for a pastor it's good to know our limits now i may want to um, you know solve a problem completely 100% but i may really not have the experience to do it or the training the equipping to do it so the sooner i understand hey this is my limit i can only say this much about this matter then put them on to somebody else who is experienced better equipped than us a christian person then that that is something uh, you know a leader should do quickly okay uh, so that is a practical thing to do then uh, another practical thing to do is to just um, I encourage both the parties involved that whatever decision will be made it will be impartial it will be based on god's word it will be ba- it will uh, uh, uphold you know who god is and his justice his righteousness and you know the principles of god's word so just encourage both parties so that you know, they are confident you know as this uh, entire resolution um, uh, you know the 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 as this this thing progresses okay uh, to solve their problem and also wherever possible it is good to put things in writing uh, so that you know later on uh, people might come back and say no but i said that and you know uh, you did this so there can be a lot of going back on their own words and these things happen so as a pastor and a leader for for uh, everyone's good Uh, if it's possible some of the key things you know that were discussed some of the key decisions that were taken will be good if you can put that in writing and maybe you know uh, uh, have a confirmation from both the parties on that so in this manner within the church setting it's possible to resolve some uh, more complex issues now after having done all this if both the parties are still not willing and they feel that hey uh you made an effort pastor but you know I, i'm not happy with this then it's left to them if if at all the person says i want to go to court or you know i want uh, uh, a a legal resolution for this matter we can't help it as the leader of the church because you've done your part to solve the matter within the uh, church setting but now the person wants to take it outside the church uh we would just need to let them do it their own way okay? because we have uh done our best in trying to resolve the matter so this is how you know i said uh, the the simple issue was we just go by the matthew 18 instruction we talk it through uh to believers then third party then finally bring the leaders in and you know that, that's how you do it more complex you know try to uh try to bring truths and then if there's an expert 
committee or a team bring them in because they will be able to speak wisdom after having done all this if people are still not uh, uh, agreeing then yes whatever they want to do if they want to go to court then you know it's up to them uh, so that's how we would deal with these matters now let's uh, continue to look at church discipline uh, and, and consider some of the other aspects so coming to correction bringing correction to individuals uh the the uh you know the the principle that we must follow is that whenever there is a private matter uh one must correct in private okay uh and not bring it up in public because sometimes it happens you know uh, there is a person in church the pastor is not happy with and maybe in the sermon in uh, an example if the pastor kind of makes a reference to that person uh you know it's very upsetting uh, for for that individual who knows and you know others around who know what's going on so making it a public matter in some cases people don't keep it that subtle subtle also they directly go ahead and talk about it in public and uh, disgrace uh, believers in the church uh, that's not the biblical way of doing things matthew 18 says that right like try to resolve it in a private way uh, and in correction you know try to bring it in a private way now if that doesn't work out uh, only later you know there is a again instructions about how you must address some matters in public so when it comes to uh, bringing correction uh, you know there can be there can be issues that arise because of cultural differences you know one great example is um, uh, in act 6 when the greek speaking and the hebrew speaking jews had a problem with the uh, with the uh, delivering of food material to the widows okay of the hellenists so they uh, complained and they said that we are not being treated well okay and the issue has arisen now the leaders of the church you know they could have uh, made a complete mess of the problem but you know praise god they moved with the wisdom of god and god gives them the wisdom to appoint certain volunteers okay this is the issue uh, two parties are quarreling they are arguing with each other um uh, let's bring peace through god's wisdom so there's an idea god gives an idea why don't you appoint volunteers who will make sure that the uh, greek speaking widows get the food that they need so they intervene in that manner and the problem is solved so a conflict is resolved okay now uh, there can be there can be um, issues arising because of some groups forming within the church or you know we use the term cliques okay so uh, some people might say that i believe in this i believe in holy spirit baptism but i don't believe in holy spirit baptism or i believe in grace uh, these people believe in law so cliques can form on the basis of uh, some some teaching or cliques can form on the basis of you know um, i like this preacher there can be three or four uh, preachers in the church and then people can say that hi whenever this person preaches i like to come to church i i don't want to come to church when so and so is preaching so the same way that you know paul had to deal with uh, matters in uh, his churches the corinthian church some people said i am of paul i am of apollos okay uh, how did paul deal with this so he he was quite strict about it he said look are you not acting uh, like carnal people are you not acting like a uh, mere men you know when you uh, have strife and envy and divisions among yourself and you make these make these uh, clicks okay, and say that i belong to paul or i belong to apollo so he was quite strict about it he addressed the matter in a letter okay and uh, he addressed it quite um, you know sternly because uh, in first corinthians 4 verse 21 he also says what do you want shall i come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness so that's very apostolic uh, he is not trying to cover up and say okay uh, they will feel bad uh, and all that no paul is quite open he is quite stern he's for he says look if you don't correct yourself then what do you want me to do 
do you want me to come uh, to you then i come in person with a rebuke or do you want me to come in a loving way so he really wanted them to get things in order when they were uh, creating cliques and trying to create division in the church so he brought correction in that manner he wrote it in a letter okay there can be moral issues that people are facing now how did paul address that so in the corinthian church it is likely that uh, at, at least one person was engaged in some form of uh, sexually immoral behavior now uh, it also uh, it seems like this person was not willing to take correction so what did paul do uh, you you have uh, uh, this in first corinthians chapter 5 uh, verse 5 where he says deliver such a one to satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the lord jesus Okay. so he is bringing very stern correction now this is where you know it it's become public maybe they attempted the matthew 18 pattern to talk to this person individually but there was no uh, you know there was no change of heart so it's come to a, a point where the matter needs to be addressed publicly so he's instructing the church and he's saying look such a person you deliver them to satan or like okay let them be whatever they want to do let them do but you know i i'll uh, uh, you know show you how that this statement and i think christopher had asked sometime back also that you know isn't it a little harsh to say something like deliver this person to satan but we see the intention of paul here he makes it clear for the destruction of the flesh okay uh, so he really wants this person to repent and with that idea he is saying you know distance yourself from this person he adds in um, first corinthians 5:13 and says put away from yourselves this evil person so yes the action is quite harsh the words are quite uh, you know stern but the intention is the restoration of that person how do we know that you no know, later on in second corinthians 2 you know he once again instructs regarding the same matter uh, he says this punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive and comfort him lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow therefore i urge you to reaffirm your love to him so you see that you know, he was strict with this individual so that the person will understand what he's he, he's doing is wrong okay so that was the point and later on after it has been a while uh, and the person has uh, hopefully you know uh, you know he has turned away from his wrong uh, behavior you know, paul is reaffirming the love and he is encouraging the church also to reaffirm the love so even the uh, if you want to call it judgment or rebuke or correction uh, that is spoken over someone must be with the intention of that person coming back to god that person uh, being restored that person once again um, living for the destiny that god has for them not to destroy them okay so but there is a place for uh, strict correction in the body of christ in the local church okay now disorderly behavior uh, we know that uh, when paul wrote to the thessalonians he spoke about somebody who had disorderly behavior so second thessalonians 3 we see in that passage he basically says that you withdraw yourself from a brother who is uh, disorderly you know maybe uh, like in this case you know we see that that individual was not working the person became a burden to the church family you know gossiping uh, just engaging in in destructive things in the community so uh, he is not happy about the behavior of the individual and 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 such behavior it's not appropriate for believers and, and that is the reason you know, he really wanted to uh, warn and correct that individual and he goes to the extent of telling uh, the the Thessalonians that you know you don't have to you don't even have to interact with this person like just it's okay you distance yourself from a person who has disorderly behavior now whenever paul is saying these things please remember he has their restoration in mind he has uh, you know um, the underlying the underlying intention is obviously love 
okay uh, but you know what to do if people are so unrelenting and stern and not willing to listen uh, the leader has to you know take some strict decisions okay now moving forward uh, paul talks about deceiving brethren so there can be some disorderly uh, brethren there can be some is people in uh, uh, you know uh, who with moral failure there can be people who are causing strife division causing clicks uh, people who come in and and you know make their cultural issues uh, really big uh, there can also be people who deceive others okay now uh, paul calls them false apostles or false brethren and this was a real problem not just for paul but uh, you know other apostles also wrote about it peter wrote about it john wrote about it so obviously there were those who were bringing about strange doctrine you know promoting uh, some other kind of teaching so all this was going on so how did paul really deal with that the so paul wrote again to the two Uh, the churches so galatians uh, we know that the the major issue for them is uh, there were people who were preaching that one must follow the jewish uh, customs to be saved and to be to remain uh, you know uh, being saved but paul knew that that was not uh, was uh, in scripture and he knew that the lord jesus and his sacrifice was sufficient for them to be receive salvation so he was very upset about it and the way he writes to the galatians so he addresses it in a letter to the ministry as they would be careful about people who are bringing false teaching so how we deal with deceptive deceiving brethren you know uh, and we would i mean at least what i have observed is more than deceptive brethren being in the church yes there are instances that you have people within the congregation you know who are uh, uh, propagating wrong doctrine and things like that but actually at least i have seen in my to a particular new uh, and all that what we do is we are able for the truth okay you remember know we uh, talked about mentoring fathers and mothers so uh, at the time when that sermon series was preached uh, at apc i remember there was so on like on the internet there were a lot of uh, teachings and sermons about you know that you have to have a spiritual father you need to have a spiritual father. so uh, when there is a false teaching the best way to overcome that is to amplify the truth so you put the truth out there whatever is the truth that will you know make that that will bring uh, um, you know that will reveal the truth about that false doctrine that people are propagating so amplify the truth okay, we may not have the opportunity to keep rebuking everyone you know who is who is uh, preaching that false teaching but Uh, as long as you are preaching the right thing people at least will know that hey yeah correct what so and so is saying is based on scripture this is the actual doctrine so amplify the truth and that should be uh, good enough then opposing brethren now in the experience of paul he did have people like this there were people who were uh, uh, so you know they could have been followers initially they could have been uh, you know very impressed by paul and his ministry but later on they turned out to be his worst opposers so he mentions names when he writes to timothy he says hymenius and alexander who my delivered to satan that they may learn not to blaspheme uh, and then you know he goes on to add uh, philetus to the list Uh, and again he says about alexander the coppersmith did me much harm may the lord repay him according to his works uh, you also must beware of him for he has greatly resisted our words so uh, there were people who were going against uh, paul so what did he do he had to issue i'm sure you know he would have gone through the matthew 18 process and uh, uh you know finally he has come to a place where he says like okay just give up on these people so that they will learn on their own but he also has to issue a public warning to the rest of the church to the rest of the uh, 
a believers and say be careful about so and so you know it has come to that point now is it okay for a pastor and a leader to do something like that now if there is a person who is creating trouble um then yes now after having done everything uh, a pastor would need to warn other believers as well so uh, it it totally depends on how the leader has gone about it and uh, you know what the situation is okay and uh, uh, so yeah in some cases uh, that may need to be done okay there is a individuals now apostle john writes about this when he talks about an individual called diotrephes who always wanted to have preeminence and uh, what he did is he would go and speak against you know the, the apostles and kind of say that hey don't they uh, in those days you know, hospitality was a big thing because people, there were no hotels and all that so whenever the apostles travel the the people of god travel to new cities they would live with other believers and it was a common practice to to uh, provide hospitality to uh, those serving in the word of god but apparently someone like diotrephes you know, he was he was speaking against uh john and uh you know creating a, a sort of a disregard in the hearts of the believers so that they were not welcome any more by uh, the church believers and john came to know about all this so what does he do you know, he says um yeah so he he basically uh again publicly lets the church know that i'm aware you know diotrephes is doing this and i'm aware and he's he's telling people about a divisive brother so uh, that's what he does he public he brings it out publicly and he tells the believers about it okay so that's about uh, dealing with people uh, who uh, don't listen right to correction or the wisdom which is being spoken to them now coming to leaders how do we deal with leaders because even that is a part of church discipline when leaders make mistakes uh that again should not be brushed under the carpet okay that's not the encouragement of god's word we have to if there's something that is wrong that has to be dealt with however when we Uh, receive an accusation against an elder the bible does tell us to give them double honor and treat them with uh, double honor so i'll just read this passage for us first timothy chapter 5 verses 19 through 22 do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear i charge you before god and the lord jesus christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice doing nothing with partiality do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins keep yourself pure so so paul is instructing timothy he is telling timothy uh to take up you know just because he says do not receive an accusation against an elder it's not that he's saying don't take it up he's saying you take it up but with proper confirmation so if you hear of an elder sinning then you need two or three witnesses so you you have doubly confirmed that this is true okay and uh, if again you know this person is not uh, changing then he says those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may Yeah. So you know, you you uh, first of all go through that whole Matthew eighteen process, everything, and if they are still unrelenting, then it can come to uh, a place where we may have to inform and you know let everyone know that so and so publicly that so and so um, you know has been engaged in this sort of uh, a, a sin or something like that, mm. and also he is. Uh, asking timothy to be careful uh, so that he does not you know that that he uh, takes care of his own faith okay when doing when dealing with uh, matters of correction just for timothy to be careful himself and not uh, you know given to uh, the sins of others okay so that's how you deal with it basically we will deal with it but in a slow way in a more honorable way 
Okay. Uh, how do we restore fallen ministers? Now, those who have been serving God, uh, is it possible that they fall away from God? Yes, it is possible. And uh, Paul gives an instruction to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. This is on page 132. And he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So he says that um, a minister of God, we already said with double honor. First of all, you confirm it. You deal with that person with double honor. And here, uh, in addition to that, you know, Paul is saying that uh, you restore that person with gentleness. Okay, you're, you're aware that the person is sinning. But with gentleness. And you be careful yourself. You know, whenever we are bringing correction to somebody, you know, we have to be careful ourselves to protect uh, you know, our walk with the Lord and our convictions and uh, you know, our standards. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, so one of the ways, some practical aspects to this is, um, you know, when we hear of a minister who has fallen, uh, then what, what could be done is... Uh, Somebody that the person respects, okay, maybe they are accountable to another senior man of God or a woman of God in the city or uh, part of that, that, you know, network of ministers or that organization. So it would be nice if through that individual, um, you know, this person, like you, you could probably have that person speak to this minister and uh, you know let the person know that what you're doing is not right and uh, you know hopefully if that person accepts then uh, the person could be taken through a uh, a period of restoration okay a period of restoration so what will that period of restoration look like basically the minister can step down from ministry now we already know god's word says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. If someone is called, uh, say, to um, uh, preach the gospel, let's say that that person has an anointing over their lives. Uh, it is a it is um, a teaching anointing, but because they are in sin now, um, they have to come clean of that. So for a season, it is best that that person does not serve in that um, ministry. So we we might. That uh, senior minister of God who's speaking to the person might might say something like, "Hey, how about you step down for about six months? Okay, uh, you don't you don't preach. You just come to church. Just be like a regular believer uh, and just you know receive receive. Uh, you walk through that period of repentance. You walk through that period of change of heart and all that, uh, and then you will we'll talk about it later and continue to be in touch with me and." Uh, Maybe the senior minister can also uh, take the support of some other ministers of God to speak into the life of this fallen minister of God. So basically what's happening is the person is not being shunned, okay? but the person is being helped into restoration by other ministers of God. Uh, and hopefully over a period of time, uh, this person repents, you know, they come clean of everything, and then they are in a place where they can step back again to uh, preach God's word, right? So that's just uh, an example for us. So if at all, there are ministers of God who, who fall, this is the way in which we can bring restoration to them. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Uh, and while talking about correction, uh, we must also remember that we have to treat people well. Okay. Uh, we know that uh, even though the Holy Spirit has made leaders, pastors, overseers over God's people, we are not called to be lords over them. Meaning, we we don't uh, we don't have the authority to to uh, you know kind of boss over people. So we must treat them with respect, and you know, uh, authority should not become abuse. Authority should not become abuse. So. I like this uh, passage. I'll read it for us. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses twenty-three to twenty-four. Uh, it says, "Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but are fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand." Okay. So it's interesting. Uh, Paul 
served for a prolonged period in Corinth uh, as compared to any other city. Okay, Corinth and Ephesus, he spent a lot of time there. And he had really built up the believers. He had gone through uh, a very difficult time uh, with the opposition and everything that God had to uh, speak to him and encourage him and say, look, uh, don't worry, you are okay. Okay, so it was that difficult for him to do ministry in Corinth. And after doing all that, you know, if, if somebody had served like that uh, for the people, they would feel that they own the people, isn't it? I've served and uh, uh, whatever you are today is because of me. You know, Paul could have said that. But look, look at the way he's writing to the Corinthians. He's saying, not that we have dominion over your faith. So he realizes and recognizes that, yes, you know, I am ministering. I'm doing, I'm going out of my way to serve these people. But they own their faith. Their faith is their faith. The progress they made is their progress. Okay. So, you know, there are these boundaries. And uh, as leaders, we can't just assume that, you know, we, we can uh, have authority over people and just abuse them and get them to do whatever we want them to do. It doesn't work like that. We are God's people and we must always remember that we are stewards of uh, you know, the people whom God has given us. So abuse, stay away from abuse. Uh, and, and if that is happening again, you know, we've seen how uh, a leader can be corrected uh, and we should go about correcting that person. So whenever correction is brought about uh, in situations like this, we already talked about this in Kingdom Builders. There can be all kinds of responses. You could have a person who says, oh, okay, thank you, Pastor. I didn't know, uh, you know, I was doing this or that this was wrong. Okay, fine, you know, I'll try to change. So somebody could genuinely repent and you might be able to see the fruit in their life. But people can also have a bunch of negative responses. Okay, so we, we said that people could probably complain, right? So... It happens. Uh, they really like you and suddenly they don't like you at all. So how do you deal with it? Uh, yeah, basically you don't take it personally. Once we have corrected somebody, they could complain. They could withdraw, uh, meaning they don't want to talk to you anymore or they just come to church and they just go. Like you can feel that, that wall between you and that individual. Okay, uh, so they might withdraw. They might also retaliate. They might... Uh, uh, come up, you know, bring up issues, uh, and then suddenly you feel very disrespected the way they are treating you, uh, maybe personally, you know, through some of uh, the emails that they are sending you and all that, or publicly, you know, publicly in a meeting, something that they say, putting you down, and you're like, wow, what, what's going on? You know, I, I, this person used to really honor and respect me so much, but now they're treating me so badly. So there can be retaliation that we face, or worse still, you know, departure. They're just gone. They, they pack their bags and leave because uh, they don't think, you know, this church is worthy of them anymore. Uh, so... How do you deal with it? You know, it is painful. And I know when we talked about uh, these matters in Kingdom Builders, even there I said this is probably one of the toughest uh, things to do, bring correction, bring the resolution of conflict. Uh, and sometimes you wonder, hey, can I just not, if, if I can, I could only just study the word and preach the word, that's enough for me. Now, why do I have to deal with all these things? But it's part of the responsibility that God has given us. So we have to. Uh, so in the case of negative responses, uh, We've said this, don't take it personally. Okay. Uh, yeah, for whatever reason that person is behaving like that, but you know, don't don't just mull over it and get depressed over it. So don't take it personally. Mm, don't take uh, offense, uh, meaning carry that, you know, unforgiveness, bitterness, and then we also react to the way they are behaving with us. Um, and give people some time. Maybe they're trying to process everything and eventually, you know, it'll it'll sort out. So give them some time. Uh, if, if sometimes this happens, you know, people just tell you later that, hey, uh, Pastor, I, um, I think I want to go to the other church or something like that. So if they want to move on, then with peace, with blessing, well, let them move on because uh, they want to grow in another place. It's okay, right? So we just let them do that and continue their walk with the Lord. So don't take it personally and don't keep bringing it up again and again. Right? This matter, oh, so and so they were in my church and this is what they did. So don't keep bringing it up again and again. 
okay uh, all right so that's how we deal with uh, um, correcting people and then uh, there's a note here which says correct in a timely manner do not procrastinate uh, that's because you know it's so uncomfortable sometimes we can just pretend like ah, i didn't see anything right i didn't hear anything uh, because then church can go on as it's going on everything is you know hunky dory happy but what happens is if we ignore uh, matters of sin matters of division strife this there's clearly some issue going on two uh, people are fighting both of them have the same business and they are competing with each other we are aware of all these matters and right? so if we just ignore it what happens is it will end up in a like a volcanic eruption someday so when we come to know that there is a matter that needs to be resolved it is best to deal with it quickly okay and in a wise way so don't put it off for tomorrow some matters um the pastor says some matters you can't even uh, sleep over it no right now something has to be done so you have to just like step in there and have the matter um uh, a result so that's about correction uh, and that's about church discipline uh, any anything to add to what i have shared please feel free you could you could uh, do so or you know any questions yeah we can discuss okay so if it's all clear then we can go to the next chapter so i think that uh, seems like um, it okay with this subject mm, all right uh, so in that case uh, we'll just yeah we have 5 minutes that's okay we will just start off the next chapter here which is about uh, church order in gatherings so basically what this says is that you know everything needs to be done in an orderly way in a uh, in a decent way so when paul instructs the uh, corinthian church you know he, he addresses certain issues when it comes to communion in communion uh, people were coming to church and just eating a lot and getting drunk and that was disorderly so he, he instructed them in that matter and said look if you need to eat you eat at home okay and you come and you please treat the lord's table with reverence so he gives them an instruction there now the corinthian church was also known for the gifts of the spirit and they were greatly exercising the gifts of the spirit so when it came to the exercise of the gifts of the spirit he first corinthians 14 is all about order he says okay when you speak in tongues do it like this when you prophesy do it like this okay so he is giving them instructions for the exercise of the gifts of the spirit so that also must not be done in a disorderly way okay so that was paul's instruction so basically when he sums up that that chapter there first corinthians 14 and uh, in verse 40 he says let all things be done decently and in order so one of the things that paul was passionate about was the order uh of church gatherings people came together for worship people came together for the exercise of the gifts of the holy spirit when people came together right to um uh, be nurtured in the word of god whatever it is he wanted to see some order because it was all about honoring god so in this uh, chapter here we are going to talk about how we can have order in our gatherings so based on what 
Paul said, let everything be done decently and in order. So whatever meetings we have, uh, we can we can select a format which will give honor to God, okay, which glorifies God. So uh, that format can be such that you know, things are done in an excellent way. Okay, we we give time for the important things in the service, which would be the ministry of the word, which would be time in worship, you know, which would be time of um, ministering to the people. Uh, we would also make sure that you know any wastage of time here and there uh, that can be cut off because sometimes what happens. Uh, we might end up taking too much time on announcements. People come there only for some two hours. In that uh, two hours, if let's say 30 minutes goes for announcements, this is happening, that is happening. Then the people uh, are not receiving you know, what they uh, came there for. So they have to consider all these things. Things need to be done uh, in order. Things need to be done with excellence. We must ensure that uh, time is not wasted. Uh, we give priority to all the uh, important parts of the gathering okay and that things are done efficiently you know, quickly uh, uh, things are done in a in a clean way so when there is order in all of these aspects of a gathering uh, it really honors god so uh, what we'll do is we will uh, probably continue with this in the next session um uh, and uh yeah we will we'll continue to discuss this uh all right so let's close up with a word of prayer uh, i just like to request someone to please lead in prayer please Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Say. Please go ahead. In the name of Jesus. Our Father, in heaven, Father God, we you thank you. you. We love you. We praise your name because you are good. We are okay, continuing sorry. to learn sorry to interrupt. about the local church, the body. Lord, uh, we thank you that Charles. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, actually, uh, Say had started praying. So can we let him complete, please? All right. Thank you, yeah, Pastor. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this class we've had. Thank you, Lord, for your daughter who you've used, O oh Lord, to instruct us on the communion, on orderliness in the church, on how, O oh God, we ought to conduct ourselves and how and what we must not do, Lord, to create factions. Father, we thank you for all that we have learned. We pray, Father, that uh, these instructions, everything, Lord, we've learned will be expounded in our hearts and, uh, Lord, we'll be able to teach others and explain to them, Lord, the importance and the blessings that come with the communion and every other thing, Lord, we've learned in this class, Lord. We pray, Father, that you continue to increase your daughter with more wisdom to instruct us, Lord, more and to give us more revelation from the word and to make us better equipped, oh God, to lead and to bring more people into the faith. We bless you, Lord, we pray as we go for our other class, we pray for wisdom to understand. And we pray that, Lord, we will continue to be useful vessels in your hands. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your holy name. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we are prayed. Amen, amen. And thank you, Say. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Charles, too. Sorry uh, for not letting me pray. Uh, all right, class. So, everyone, have a blessed day, and we'll meet again in the next session. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. Bye.